Good morning. Welcome to worship. We have a few announcements this morning. A reminder to those of you who are on session, we did move session to next week so that we will all be free to celebrate Father's Day in whatever way we'd like to do that. Um, a reminder that Vacation Bible School is coming back to Fred Prez this summer. It's an exciting thing for all of us. There are flyers out on the table. Share them with your friends and neighbors who have children. We want to make this um, just wonderful and bring as many kids into this building to learn about the love of God as we can. Um, we're making it as easy as possible. They can register by paper. They can scan the little QR code and go online to register. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to take care of that. Um, and that is going to be July 16th through the 18th. So you have lots and time, lots and lots of time to invite neighborhood children. Um, Lifeline screening is coming up on the 11th. So if you signed up to do that, you want to kind of take note of that date. June 23rd, we have our pet blessing service outside. Hopefully we'll have perfect weather and be able to do that. Uh, this Saturday is the men's breakfast. It's a little bit different this month. Um, all the men are invited out to the Greg Farm, to the Greg Lake. They're gonna have breakfast. They're gonna do a little fishing, a lot of fellowshipping and that's kind of like their Father's Day treat, just like we ladies had our tea. So uh, all you gentlemen, I hope you get to enjoy that. Sounds like a lot of fun. Do we have any other announcements for the good of the congregation? If not, we also have a birthday to celebrate this week. Nancy has a birthday on Wednesday. So wish her a happy birthday. Well, you might not know it, given the unassuming looks of things today, but today is a pivotal day in the church year. In the early months of the church's liturgical calendar, which starts either in late November or early December, we begin with all kinds of celebrations. Beginning with Advent and continuing, continuing through Trinity Sunday, we celebrate key moments in the life of Christ. Things like Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Ash Wednesday, Palm Sunday, Holy Week, Easter, and the day of Pentecost. And then for a little while, things are allowed to quiet down. The church calls this season ordinary time, and with each church season, it comes with its own color. Like the coming of spring, spring ordinary time is green, symbolizing life and hope, revelation and growth. Ordinary time is a time for us to reflect on the life and teachings of Jesus. It is a time to be nourished by the word, to renew our faith and grow in our relationship with Jesus. It is a time for refreshing that comes with the gentleness of an ordinary day. This year, our lectionary assignment takes us to the book of Mark. And as we return to our readings in Mark today, we find Jesus dealing with the Pharisees in such a way as to produce controversy. Jesus purposefully placed himself in their bad graces so that he could teach us about priorities and love and grace. Let us rise as we are able for the call to worship. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Brothers and sisters, praise the Lord. Let us pray. 
God, our protector and comforter, our shield and defender, hear our glad praises as we boast of your goodness. We gather as witnesses to your redeeming graciousness. We worship in response to your encompassing love. The birds sing to start to sing before the sun even rises, proof that you promise the dawn of new life while it is yet dark. Let your light now shine in our darkness that we may discern your will for us, giving you the honor and glory due your name. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 409, God is Here. Good morning. Time to get back in harness there. <laughs> Join me now in the call to confession, then we'll do the prayer of confession in unison. Even before we speak, God knows our wrongs, yet our repentance opens our hearts to God, who is waiting to hear us and forgive us. Let us confess all that separates us from God and others. Let us pray. God, who formed our inward parts and knows our hearts, Forgive us. Instead of acknowledging you as our God, we make our own idols. 
Instead of proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord, we proclaim ourselves. Instead of turning to the Holy Spirit, we attempt to attain your way through our own understanding. Redirect our wrong ways and lead us to the ways that make Jesus visible in our lives. Amen. In Christ, we died to our old selves and became new creations. Therefore, we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord. The life of Jesus is in us, and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May our hearts and minds be like the young boy Samuel, who didn't know the Lord yet, earnestly waiting to hear your word. Speak to us, O Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, for your servants are listening. Amen. First scripture reading is from 1 Samuel. And now let's hear the story of that young boy. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called to Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went out and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, down, not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Now go with the peace of Christ and give the gesture of peace to your neighbor.
We are going to have a little bit of fun this morning because I brought a couple of different things with me. We have been, over the last few weeks, talking about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because we have one God, it's kind of hard for us to kind of wrap our heads around this, but we have one God, but he has three persons, right? He's God, he's Jesus, and he's the Holy Spirit. We know God looks out for all of us. We know God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to come be with us. And we know that Jesus died and came back to life again to pay for our sins so we don't have to. And then, sorry, it was humming in my ears. Then, the another thing we learned about the three people of God is that when Jesus went away, because he had to go back to heaven, he said, I am never going to leave you alone. He said, I promise you, I will never leave you alone. Well, I have a little something here to kind of help us think about what promises are like. We have our promises that we make to people, and most of the time, most of us are pretty good about keeping the big promises, right? If it's really important, we come through, right? Yeah, we do. But what about all those little promises we make? Like, I'll call you tomorrow. Oh, but then tomorrow we completely forget or we get busy or we just like, you know what, it's late. I could call, but I'm tired. Oh, I'll call tomorrow, the next day, right? That's, that's a promise we made, but we kind of break it. So for people, we're kind of like this. Our little promises kind of fall through the cracks sometime, right? But the big promises we have, they stay. Yeah, that's what people are like. Sometimes the little ones fall through, but the big ones generally keep. But this is what God is like. Every single promise that God makes, he keeps. Every single one of them. All the little ones and all the big ones. So when God said, I will never, ever leave you, he meant it. And so the way he never, ever leaves us is he left the Holy Spirit here with us. We can't see him. We don't know where he is. But he's that voice that talks to us in our hearts, in our heads, that kind of keeps us on track. It reminds us of the goodness of God's love. It reminds us of all of the wonderful things. He reminds us of all the wonderful things that Jesus did for us. And he fills us up on the inside and helps us do all the things we're supposed to do. Because when we try to do life all on our own, we kind of fail, right? And all of our efforts look a little bit flat, right? Yep. But when the Holy Spirit, cross your fingers, everybody, comes on the inside of us and helps us do all the things we're supposed to do for God, we are filled up with all the goodness of God. How about that? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. And we're going to set this down on the floor because it wants to slide off the table. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He fills us up with all the good things of God. And so why don't we thank God for all his goodness by praying? Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be my name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find us the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Prepare our hearts. 
hearts for prayer, let us turn in our hymnals to number 69, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. As we share our joys and our concerns, let us keep Anna Lisa and Ruth and Jim and Becky and Donnie and Sue in our prayers. Do we have other concerns to share? Yes. Bruce's friend Scott is having colon trouble, so let's pray for him and pray that the doctors can find a solution there. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Mighty God, you lift the burdens from our shoulders and free our hands from oppression's weight. We thank you for such power to save. We pray for people who long and wait for freedom and justice to come, for those trapped in the violence of war, for those struggling against unjust laws, for those weighed down by debt, for those seeking employment, for those bent low from hopelessness or grief. Stretch out your arms, we pray, and set things right. Bring us out of our complacency to a place of awareness and willingness to help those in need. Healing God, you know our illnesses and limitations, our fears and secret pains, our unclaimed gifts and discarded dreams. 
Make us well, we ask, and set us free. Be with those who have asked this congregation for prayer, for those whom we have named and those we have not named, but whose burdens we carry in our hearts. Bring strength, healing, and comfort in ways that you know are best needed. God of Sabbath rest, grant peace and restoration to your world that is wearied by work and worry, depleted by environmental degradation, and beset by famine, fire, and storm. Renew the face of the earth that your creation may be restored to wholeness and where every creature can live without harm. We pray these things. Bring to us the day of your designing when all things in heaven and on earth will be reconciled and your great shalom shall fill all in all. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is our hope. Amen. <clears throat> our gospel text for today comes from Mark chapter 2 through chapter 3, verse 6. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are, you not, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of, the, of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. <clears throat> Although this is not Advent or Christmas, as we move into ordinary time, I am going to tell you a story that begins at Christmas because this is a story of love. It's the story of the fourth wise man, and his name was Artaban. He set out like the others to follow the star, and he took with him gifts for the king. He took with him magnificent sapphires, precious rubies, and pearls of great price. These were gifts for the king. He got a late start and was riding hard to meet up with the other three wise men at the agreed upon place. Time was short and they would leave, would have to leave without him if he was late. Suddenly he saw a dim figure on the ground before him. It was a traveler stricken with fever. If he stayed to help, he surely would miss his friends, yet what could he do? So he stayed and he helped and he healed the man. But now he was alone. He needed camels and bearers to help him across the desert because he had missed his friends and the caravan. He had to sell the sapphires to get what he needed for the journey. And he was sad because the king would not have 
his gems. He journeyed on, and in due time he came to Bethlehem, but again he was too late. Joseph and Mary and the baby had gone, and then there came the soldiers to carry out Herod's command that the children should be slain. Artaban was in a, in a house where there was a little child, and the pounding of the soldiers came upon the door as the cries of the stricken mothers rang out in the streets. Artaban stood in the doorway tall and dark, and with the rubies in his hand, he bribed the captain of the soldiers not to come inside. The child was spared, and the mother rejoiced, but Artaban was sad because Jesus would not have his rubies. More than 30 years afterwards, as he searched those many, many years in vain, Artaban came to Jerusalem. There was a crucifixion that day, and when Artaban heard of this Jesus who was to be crucified, he knew in his heart that Jesus was the king he had been searching for for so long. Maybe his pearls could buy the life of a king. Yet as he arrived down the street came a girl fleeing from a band of soldiers. My father is in debt, and they are taking me to sell as a slave to pay the debt. With pleading eyes, she clung to Artaban and begged for his help. Artaban hesitated, and then sadly he took out his pearls and gave them to the soldiers to pay the debt. And Artaban was sad because the king would not receive the pearls. Then the skies went black and the earth began to quake. And as the building next to Artaban began to break apart and crumble, he was struck on the head by falling debris. He sank half conscious to the ground and as the girl pillowed his head in her lap, she heard him say to someone unseen, Not so, my lord, for when did I see thee hungry or feed thee, or thirsty and give thee a drink? When did I see a stranger and care for thee, or naked and clothe thee? When did I see thee in prison and come to thee? Thirty-three years I have looked for thee, but I have never seen thy face, nor ministered to thee, my king. And then, like a whisper from very far away, there came a voice saying, Very truly, I say to you, inasmuch as thou hast done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, thou hast done it unto me. And Artaban smiled in death, because he knew that the king had received every one of his gifts. I told you this story of love so that I could tell you another story of love, one involving a dispute over the Sabbath that will teach us another facet of love. The law concerning the Sabbath says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, that is, he made it holy, and he set it aside for rest. At the fall, God laid down consequences for mankind, and one of them was that the ground would be cursed, and only through painful toil would we eat from it. But that did not mean that God was without compassion for our weariness. Using his own work as an example, God said, look, if I can create the universe in six days and rest on the seventh, you can do the same with your work. I want this for you, and so I have blessed this day in this way for you. 
But in true human fashion, we got this one wrong too. And given our tendency toward legalism, it's easy to see how this happened. How heavy do you suppose this glass is? This glass full of water? You don't need to answer, but think about it. What would your answer be? A few ounces? Half a pound, maybe? Not more than a pound, I suppose. But the reason you don't need to answer is because the absolute weight of this glass of water doesn't really matter. That's because it depends on how long I hold it. If I were to hold this glass for a couple of minutes, it would seem light. If I were to hold it for an hour straight without setting it down, its weight might start to make my arm ache a little bit. If I tried to hold it for a whole day straight, the weight of this little glass of water would become too much of a burden for me to hold on to. In each case, the weight of the glass doesn't change, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it feels to me. Sabbath rest is supposed to be like this glass of water, refreshing, restorative. And if taken in and set down, it nourishes us. But its restorative properties are lost if all we do is hold it out there and examine it. And that's what the Pharisees did. They held God's gift out until their arms and the arms of everyone else ached from the burden. This is what legalism does, and we are all susceptible to this error in judgment, to making this mistake. We can create as much tension over whose turn it was to take out the trash as the Pharisees did over keeping the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was not meant to be held out as some sort of sacred burden. It was intended to be a precious gift of love from God for God's people. As we look at the events of our story, we see that love, not sacrifice, is the message Jesus tried to communicate to the Pharisees, but they wouldn't hear. As for their accusations regarding work, they really weren't wrong, not in the strictest sense. For the disciples to pick grain and to eat it means that they violated at least four major classifications of work, including reaping, winnowing, threshing, and preparing a meal. But Jesus countered their complaint with the word. Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? When David was fleeing for his life, he came to the tabernacle in Nob and demanded food from the priest. But the only food available was the showbread. The showbread consisted of 12 loaves of bread that were placed on a golden table in front of the Holy of Holies. And they were sac a sacred offering for God. Jesus called it the bread of the presence. And this bread was to be changed out once a week. And when it was changed, only the priests were allowed to eat the old bread. No one other than a priest was allowed to eat it. Yet in his time of need, David took and ate that very showbread. So Jesus showed that scripture itself supplied a precedent in which human need takes priority over human and even divine law. Jesus then reinforced his principle by healing the man's withered hand. Calling the man forward, Jesus said to them, is it lawful to do good or save a life on the Sabbath? Or is it lawful to harm and kill? To which they had no reply. I can almost hear the word only inserted in this. Is it lawful to do good or save a life? Or is it only lawful to kill and do harm? That's because Jesus, knowing what God intended for the Sabbath and seeing how messed up it had become at the hands of the leaders, he could see that they were killing themselves and others with all of their petty rules and their regulations and all the burdens that they were imposing on one another and on themselves. And so Jesus said to the man on the Sabbath, 
stretch out your hand. And his hand was restored. This was an intentional action. He could have waited till the next day. He didn't because there was something more important at hand here. Through the word and by his actions, Jesus proved that it is indeed lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And as for the second part of his question, is it legal on the Sabbath to cause harm or kill? This he answered with no words. His look said it all. The Bible says he looked around at them. I would imagine he met their eyes one by one by one. And he looked at them with anger. Sometimes we can see volumes in a single look. This was one of those times. The Bible also tells us that Jesus was grieved over the hardness of their hearts. Like an arm held out too long, they had grown numb and cold inside. Jesus was angered by their callousness and grieved because their misguided attempts at being good were in fact causing harm. And in their obstinance, they would not see the truth. They could not see that the best way to use sacred things, including the law, was to use them for human beings. The showbread was never so sacred as when it was used to feed starving men. Artaban's gifts were never so precious as when they were used to help those with great need. The law was never so sacred as when it was fulfilled in love. As for the law, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And when speaking of the commandments, Jesus said, there really are just two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, none of us on our own can love perfectly with all our heart, soul, and mind, but we can grow in love with the help of the Holy Spirit. That which God commands, God enables. Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand, a thing he clearly could not do, but with the command came the enabling. We all have our days where we act more like Pharisees than loving children of God. There are times when we want to scream at the world or scream at our favorite person or even at ourselves when we get wrapped up in legalistic concerns. You know it was your turn to take out the trash. But this is the moment when we need to pause and remember that a life was never more sacred than when it was given in love for us at Calvary. The law has its place. It is sacred, but it is love that fulfills the law. And when we get this part right, everything else falls into place. Before I close with prayer, I leave you with this advice from Paul to the Corinthians. Be on your guard, stand firm in faith, be courageous, be strong, and most of all, do everything in love. Let us pray. Loving God, send your Holy Spirit to live in our hearts, to teach us how to love, Help us to discover what Artaban discovered, that the best way to use sacred and precious things, both tangible and intangible, are to use them for people. We thank you for giving the gift of the Sabbath. Help us to practice the Sabbath rhythm of life. Work and rest, work and rest, work and rest. We rest because you rested. We rest because you command it. We rest in order to remember that the world and our own worth do not depend on our efforts and accomplishments. We rest in such a way that others may also rest, 
not only other human beings, but also creatures and creation itself. You made the Sabbath for us because you know what is good and necessary for us. We thank you, we praise you, we rest in you. Amen. God lifts burdens from our shoulders and frees our hands from work, giving the gift of regular rest. In freedom and joy, we give back to God a portion of all we have been given, that others may rest in fullness as well. For Sabbath rest and all other gifts that sustain us in life, we thank you, O God. Accept, we pray, the gifts we offer in return, our small hands reaching toward your mighty hand in gratitude and in simple trust. In Christ's name we, name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 649, Amazing Grace. As you leave this place to love and serve the Lord, may the grace of Christ surround you, the Holy Spirit sustain you, and the peace of God rest upon you now and always. Amen.